Good evening, folks. How's everyone doing tonight? Uh, welcome to the Avon Theater. My name is Adam Birnbaum. I'm the director of film programming. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I would just like to ask at this time if everybody could please uh, help me out and turn off all phones and other wireless devices, and please do keep them off for the duration of the film as well as the Q&A afterwards, and thank you in advance for that. Uh, just curious, by show of hands, do we have any members here tonight at the Avon? That's great. Uh, so we are a member-based nonprofit organization. For those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, it is through your support and membership that we are able to continue to do these great things like tonight's screening of Bisbee 17, which uh, technically speaking is not only part of our documentary night program, but actually is a sneak preview. The film hasn't even opened yet theatrically. Uh, so we're really delighted to be able to show this. Uh, we have a slew of special events coming up and for any and all of those special events and all screenings, uh, members do get a discounted ticket for any show that you come to see at any time. Uh, I'd also mention that we have carte blanche memberships, which on an annual basis, if you pay a higher fee, you can see everything free all the time. And I can say that unlike MoviePass, it will actually work. You can come to this theater, we'll be here. I had to, I had to just slip that in, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, think about that. Uh, a couple things to mention about tonight's program. Uh, first, we are really thrilled to be bringing back uh, the team that made the movie, Fourth Row Films. And uh, yes, uh, let's give them a hand. Their entire team of producers and the director, Robert Green, are actually all here and will be participating in a post-film Q&A. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that they're here. They're going to be here for a Q&A afterwards. We really are appreciative that they've come. Um, and just a little fun fact, a number of them are from this area originally, and we've had a long-standing and very fruitful collaboration with them and the many films that they've produced over the years. So we're thrilled to have them back and just want to say thank you guys for once again coming back to the Avon with your latest work. Yeah. And along those same lines, we have uh, a co-promoter, co-presenter, collaborator, if you will, this evening, an organization in our community that we have worked with on an annual screening event for, uh, this is going to be the sixth year in a row. Uh, they were formerly known as Neighbors Link. Neighbor Link, Neighbors Link. Uh, they are now known as Building One Community. Uh, they play an integral role here and we've once again found a film in Bisbee 17, which I'm going to allow to speak for itself and simply say that it is very topical, very of the moment, and in certain ways I think it speaks to and dovetails very nicely from what Building One is trying to do here in Stanford uh, as we look back and reconcile parts of American history and address what's going on here in our community and thinking about the future at the same time. And so without further delay, I'd like to welcome Ann Downey up to the stage, who's uh, here on behalf of Building One, and she's going to say a few words before we get started tonight. Thank you, Ann. Thanks, Adam. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out tonight to support two great organizations here in Stanford, Avon Theater, and Building One Community, the Center for Immigrant Opportunity. I'd like to thank Adam and his team for offering this film to us. As he said, it's the sixth year that we've worked together to bring to you a film that highlights some aspect of the immigrant experience. And while I haven't seen this film, I think we're in for a really incredible evening, so thank you. I also wanted to um, acknowledge another person in the audience. It's a person who is an active sponsor of both the Avon Theater and an incredible volunteer for Building One Community for the last six years. She was instrumental in founding this event and making it happen. And um, as I say, she's, she's really done a lot for both organizations, and I know she's not going to want to be acknowledged, but let's hear for Mark Rubenstein. Thank you very much. Give it up. We, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for her. She's got 
all sorts of skills, and these are two of her organizations that she's very passionate about, so thank you. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Building One Community, we are, our mission is to bring passionate people together to help immigrants and their families succeed in the community. And we do that in a number of ways with programs that we call the four E's. We educate through our English as a Second Language classes. We employ through our skills development programs and hiring center. We empower through our family services and legal services programs and we engage with our volunteers and through community events like this. Last year, we serviced over 2,800 clients uh, representing 54 different countries. So that gives you an idea of how diverse Stanford is and how much um, you know people like to come here because we are inclusive, we're open, and I think we're just a wonderful community. But um, we also, over the course of last year, we had, I think it's 1,300 English language learner, learners in the group. We provided um, support in the, in the form of assistance for tax preparation, uh, immigrant issues, uh, healthcare, parenting and school engagement, all sorts of different programs that really support the community. And we run on volunteers. Boston may run on Duncan, but we run on volunteers. And so if any of you are interested and would like to help, would like to give your time, we can always find something for you to do. So uh, please feel free to visit our website. It's buildingonecommunity.org. Numer or just give us a call. And if you'd like to come by the facilities here in Stanford, and uh, you can take a look at what we do and see if there's a, a good fit for your talent. So again, thank you so much for coming tonight and I hope you enjoy the film. Thank you, Ann. So folks, once again, we encourage you to please stick around after the movie. We have an amazing panel and Q&A. This is a very, very interesting film and one that I'm certain will elicit uh, a number of questions and discussions. So uh, stick around afterwards and thank you all once again for coming. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming and for staying for the Q&A. Um, before I bring up, uh, well, let me, let me first bring up the director, Robert Green. And then we have uh, two, the two other producers here tonight. Uh, Susan Bedusa, are you here? Are you here? Um, the, the three of us have worked together for a long time and Susan has had to put up with a lot between the two of us, so she, she deserves extra applause. Um, Bennett Elliott, please come on up. Bennett's one of the other producers. And then a, a, a person who's been with Fourth Row Films a, a long time um, and really helps produce all of our films, uh, produces some of them directly, and uh, has helped produce all of Robert's films in a way from the office is uh, Danielle Rosen. And if she could come up here. And she just got married, so we should give her yeah. a <laughs> And then we're, we're also lucky to have the assistant editor who really helped Robert put this film together because Robert edited the film as well. Um, and I guess she'd be the newest addition to the uh, fourth row family. Kellen Marvin, please come up. She's here from Missouri. <laughs> and be, and before, we, before we get started, I just want to say, if you, could, if you couldn't tell from all the thank yous at the end of the uh, credits, um, it, there's just so much that support that goes into making a film or having a, a life or career in film. And we all have a, our own sort of um, support system of friends and families. Some of them, some of you are here tonight. And, but I just wanted to specifically thank mine who are here, which is my awesome wife, Kristen. Woo! Um, my parents, Vince and Barb Tarola. Um, and my daughter, Charlotte. Oh. I was only nervous that Charlotte was watching the film. That was the, 
<laughs> I was like, geez, that's, that's, that's the stakes. That's high stakes there. Yeah, so the, uh, yeah, some of these relationships predate Charlotte. So, um, so Robert, let, let's just start by asking, how did you, what was the idea to make this movie, and what are you trying to say with this movie, and why did we have to go to Arizona to make it? Um, well, yeah, so you guys remember that we, in 2003, I first came to Bisbee, and um, I just loved the place. My, my mother-in-law bought a house, like an old mining shack, sort of thing that um, that a lot, a lot like uh, many of the houses. Actually, we filmed in a scene in one of the houses, or in her house. Um, and we, I, I just fell in love with the place and, and immediately heard about this heinous story, right? And I took it right back to Doug and Sue, because um, we were working together at the time. And my first thought was, hey, we, we should reenact this event in this town that has like not dealt with this at all. Um, they they hadn't they hadn't dealt with it, and I didn't know what that meant at all. This was many years before I made my first feature, and we're, we we hadn't even really gone on the path of documentaries yet, the way we we've ended up going. And I, I didn't I just there was a I guess part of it was just that when you see in the film, there's the post office looks exactly like the post office did a hundred years ago, and there's not a lot of places like that. There's uh, certainly if you drive around here in New England, you get the sense of houses that have been around for a really long time, but there's something really frozen in time about Bisbee as a place, partly because it, it almost was a ghost town in 1975 when the mines closed, as we talked about in the movie. And for me, the this idea of like getting people together, I, I knew immediately because I, I read um, Bisbee 17 by Robert Houston, which is a book, uh, that was a, it's a novelization of the story. And, um, I, you know, it's it was horrifying. I was very interested in the, in the labor aspect of it, and and for many years we were trying to figure out how to make this movie. And finally, the hundredth anniversary presented this opportunity to go back, and people were ready to talk. and And I knew from the beginning that it was weirdly still divisive. And in Bisbee, it's the kind of thing where it used to be company versus worker, then it became. Com company families that were left over versus all the hippie liberals that moved in town, you know. And you, uh, what what would happen is like with Lori McKenna and many other people is you you come into town and you fall in love with this place with the cheap rent and and the cool weird vibe, and then you find out they you know forcibly deported 1,200 people out of town, you know, in the recent fairly recent past in some ways. So. I, I, there, there always felt like there was some energy there to to go down the path of, and so we slowly sort of built the film. By we took several trips, and then we moved there in in June, and um, and basically f met people that had stories relating to it, family pe family members, or people that had related to the story in different ways, like the very scary guy James, who we we were. I remember the meeting that we had with him. Ben, it was like let's meet with this actor, he wants to be in the movie. And I was like, oh God, a, a t like an actor, it's like not really the vibe we're looking for. And then he said he had deported all these people. And I was like, okay, you can be the villain, that's easy. Um, and then, so we combined sort of personal stories with historical characters and that's how we kind of fused it into what we did. So let me ask you one other question, which is if, what would you want people to take away in two aspects from the film? The thematically, the ideas, like Adam was saying before, that really speak to so much that's going on in the country today, and also from a filmmaking point of view. Well, I mean, for me, the thing to, t I mean, you have to understand, like, when we've, I finally figured out where the scene where Mel, who's in his bodega, gets ripped out of his bodega, the day that I figured that out, 100 7-Elevens around the country were raided and people were deported out of those, uh, out of the, uh, you know, just out of the country, they had jobs and they were ripped out. I mean, it's the same thing. So the relevance couldn't be more obvious. There's no, there's no, there's no need to like underline the relevance, so, so to speak. But I mean, for us, it was it, what, what became clear is like we started making the film in October of 2016. No one thought Trump would be elected, right? And then, and then the next time we came back in January, everyone in town knew why we had to do this film and why they had to be a part of it, and that. And that was just a, a very particular energy. It's a very, it's it's the one liberal town in all of Red Arizona, and so people were ready to dig into this, um, which was important. But to me, the film is about it's about how sort of mythologies 
are used to divide us, basically. I mean, the, the, the story of the IWW, the industrial workers of the world, they wanted to tear down the capitalist system and blow everything up and, and start fresh and workers own the mines and all that. And then you had the company who basically said, there is no Bisbee without the company. It's a company town, which what that means is it's, it's a place in the Mule Mountains that no one would ever go to unless we discovered copper here and all the minerals and we built the town. It's our place and you've come into our place and said, you know, we, we, we want to change things. And so those are just two narratives and they're built on very sort of um, very firm, strong uh, uh, ideologies and mythologies that continue today. So when you when you read a story in the New York Times about what's happening on the border, so the way things are described, you know, or way things people imagine, you know, what's happening, it's very much still the good guy with a gun fighting the Wild West, you know, villains coming over the border. I mean, it's just, it's, it's we cling to these sort of mythologies, and so the 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 idea is that seeing people reenact that, you get to think about that. You get to think about storytelling, actually, as much as you think about the heinous thing that happened. This awful thing in history was awful. It's, it's one thing to just know that, but, but the idea is that we know more about the stories that led to that. What, what were the ideologies that led to that? What were the mythologies that we can't you know, shake from our lives that, that led to that? And that's, so that's why we chose to make the film the way we made it. So I want, I want to ask, Susan and Bennett, who, who don't always as anxious to answer questions as, as we would be, but but um, people always say like, what does a producer do? It, and and it, 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 you know, there's a hundred definitions and that's not, that doesn't carry at all. So could you each tell us something you're really proud of that you were a part of in this film? Or we can do it for you. <laughs> or you can just tell a funny anecdote about it, but us being in Arizona. But um, I mean, I think the film was challenging for a lot of reasons, and it was it was exciting, and we knew that Robert was gonna, you know, if we put all our trust in him, he was gonna come out and make a great film. When we got to Bisbee, we did not have the money that we needed to finish the movie, so. Um, we had to really sort of like scrounge and I, I mean, Bennett had people eating ramen noodles for weeks. Um, so I think- They liked it. Yeah, they, they, they're college kids. Um, but I think getting, getting this much on the screen for the amount of money that we had uh, at the time was really kind of impressive. And I think to Sue's point, something that I think Sue and I were always really worried about was from the beginning, Robert was very serious about wanting to build a train. Very <laughs> serious. And as we were trying to like price out, like how do you do that? <laughs> um, we just kind of, that was like one of the craziest things, like in between all of the money and, and the casting and trying to figure everything out, we were just like building a train right. in, in the background. <laughs> and also, yeah, the train. I mean, the train, the train was, a, was a thing. Um, <laughs> And the, it was a thing. It's a thing. And the horse. The horse was oh, a the thing. Horses. The horses. Um. We can't make a Western without a horse. Let's just like, you don't get to, you, you, that was just a non starter. I, I, you know, might as well not have a. But I think Bisbee is an amazing place because if you need to build a train, there's a guy that's like a train enthusiast from like very into trains before 1920. And he could tell us exactly what the train looked like, what color it should be. And Sue and I were like, Godspeed, just build this train and build it on time. But that was like one of the non-negotiables, I think, that I'm, I'm proud that we got people on that train right before it fell apart. <laughs> right before it actually fell apart. So, so let me do this, before we open up to questions, I just want to ask, so Danielle, you've worked yeah, well, this is a She's film audience, so, have, he, so everybody knows that how much work goes into a film, especially I think in an audience like, like at the Avon here, who really in film enthusiasts. What what is it that you like about the work that would make you still want to do this? You know, you didn't take an exit path like after year five, and now it's like year twelve. So what what is it that you like about the work? Well, I think the thing that's exciting about filmmaking and especially documentary film, is with every film that you make, it's uh, a focused look into a community or into a life that you wouldn't have a chance to 
walk in unless you're making a project like this. And so with every project, you get the opportunity to walk in someone else's community, in someone else's world, to live a life that you wouldn't have lived if you hadn't made that project. And so with every project, that's what you know I look forward to, and I'm sure everyone else does, is that you, you just get to live these other lives. And then, Kellen, you're not going to get off free. So, <laughs> so I mean, for the, I think that for us up, the five of us up here, we, there's sort of a, a teaching, mentoring sort of atmosphere to our culture. Robert's actually a professor at the University of Missouri in their journalism department, and Kellen was one of his students, um, I think until this year, right? So, so she became an assistant editor wh while being a student. So I want to ask you, what, what, is there a moment where you were starting to edit under sort of Robert's guidance? Because you, Kellen would go through the dailies, which is the daily footage, and try and Robert give her direction to put things together. Is there a moment where you're like, I totally, where it just comes together for you when you're like, I see what we're doing here? Uh, no, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there was- Right answer. Uh, <laughs> Actually, there are some shorts that we're releasing, and there was this one thing that I cut and I showed Robert, and he was like, um, it was the first time that he complimented me on rhythm, and I'm gonna remember that for the rest of my life, um, because he like would talk on and on in class about rhythm, and um, it, it was amazing being able to sit with him and like watch him take some like garbage that I'd pulled together and like turn it into magic. Um, and then that was like one moment where I actually felt a footprint on something that we did. Awesome. So does anybody have any questions? Do, we have, do I? Oh. <laughs> the, uh, Everyone I, has to have a mic. It's beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you so it's much. so stunning and compelling and current and scary. Um, is, do you have any, Robert, um, were there any films that you drew upon? It's such a unique style, visually and otherwise. Is there any inspirations or influences in, in making this particular film? Yeah, um, the filmmaker Peter Watkins is a big influence. Has anyone ever seen Punishment Park, a film from 1971? Um, it's, it's this horrifying thing that, but it features people who are, have a, they're, they're expressing their real opinions while they're playing roles. Um, that was one thing. But the, the thing particularly for this film is that you know, in the, the mythology storytelling thing, part of what we're doing is referencing the way we look at movies, right? So some of it looks like a Western, some, there's musical elements, there's even like telenovela, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of style occasionally. And for me, it, it was not necessarily one filmmaker necessarily, it was more like thinking about how we process stories and create images and, and you know how collaborative that can be. Like I, I kind of like to think that everybody was in their own movie. Richard was in a western, and Fernando was in a MTV musical, and uh, you know it was just different, different styles. And and that was you know so it just it's a whole bunch of movie history stuff. But it also, which also has to do with the theatricality of the IWW. You know the the, the workers, many workers movements throughout history have you know, leaned into music and, and sort of performance as a, as a thing. So that was as much of an influence as movies, but, um, but certainly Peter Watkins is a big, big one. And then basically we, we watched a ton of Westerns and um, weirdly Mike Lee, uh, t the movie Topsy Turvy was a big reference because the way he plays with you know, performance within the film was, was fun for us. And, um, our cinematographer, Jared Alterman, um, pulled a lot of images from films about labor, and we, we sort of thought about those, you know, so uh, all kinds of movies, um, yeah. We're just gonna pass the mic back and forth, I think. Um, thank you very much, it's an incredible, thank you. incredible film, and Doug, I love you already, now I love you more, which is <laughs> hard to believe, but thank just you. seems to happen. Um, it, it's such a, a complex film. There's so many layers to it. I kind of I have a couple of questions. The first is just like, did you know all those layers were there when you went into it? Yeah, I mean, this is how we've made these last few films that we've made together. It's sort of like, that's what's exciting to me is that it's, that there's so, so many different things happening at once. I really find most documentaries, there's one thing happening and it can be compelling or boring or whatever you think, right? But like, 
there's not much else going on. But all the movies I love throughout history have every scene has multiple layers of things going on, right? So um, to me, it's just the way I think about constructing these things is, I'll give just one example of Richard who says, I, you know, I didn't walk like a woman like, like supposedly Harry Wheeler did. Or I've never been told I walk like a woman, which is just a great way of not being an asshole. He says, I've never been told I walk like a woman, <laughs> even though um, he probably could have said it a bunch of different ways. But so you're thinking about that later when he's violently deporting people, you know, like you're th and that's exciting that that the movie's more about his himself, you know, him. And then he's playing dress up and it's a Western and, and then he's playing a character that he doesn't really relate to, but he does and he's defending these heinous actions and all this other stuff. And I just don't think there's, the, the story is actually that complex. And so the layering gets you a sort of mental end to how complex the story is. We can't tell you everything that makes it so complex. We can't, it would be, it was almost a six hour movie. I know this probably felt like six hours, but it wasn't, it was almost a six hour movie for real. Like that's because it's so, it's such a complex story. So how do you get at that? Well, you, you do it with layering and having several different things happen at once. So yeah, I mean, it kind of went into the conception of the movie from the beginning, but to achieve that, you need people doing, I mean, the thing I always talk about these guys, the best producers on the planet, is that, you know, we were making a fiction film and a documentary at the exact same time, and no one can do that, especially at the resources that we had. So um, it, I ask a lot because I know we need all those things, and we need to create those layers. My, my second question is, you know, with this, at the center of it, all those layers is this kind of simply bifurcated narrative, right, which is so, contemporary also where you have you know everyone's kind of living in their own truth and you have Jim Acosta getting yelled at you know in the background by all these people which is a mob mentality just like what's you know manifested artificially in the film right and you know how much of this kind of like of this narrative that played out as, as almost like a, a, a role play truth and reconciliation uh, committee you know, how much of it ended up in real reconciliation? How many people uh, would you say in the aftermath switched, uh, you know, f switched point of views from where they started? I mean, you see it on the movie. Doug Graham, you know, says, he says, you know, my family was on this side. And then they, you know, I, th I now see that this was not what we should be doing, basically, to paraphrase, right? Um, we don't, I, I, up until a couple weeks ago, my answer for this, since, since I've been answering the same question um, since Sundance, because people really want to know, like, did this thing work? I, I don't have any idea. Like, I, to me, we definitely, you know, shook up the snow globe, so to speak, and, and we have yet to, it was very quick, you know, like it was, it was a year ago or so. But since we have since played the film in Bisbee, I can, I do think that something's happened. I think basically people now think the story cannot be buried again. And it has been for 100 years. And whatever that process of going through things, I think one white guy says, you know, it was group therapy, but then I think you hopefully see the images. There are plenty of other people that might not describe it as group therapy, you know? Well, that one guy said that, well, what does he know? You know, I, I don't know. I, to me, it's not an easy question and it's not meant to be easy, right? I wouldn't want to make a movie where it's like, guys, we did it, we solved all these issues, you know? Like, we, did, we reenacted a thing and then and now the whole town's fine and we figured it out. And to me, it's like, we could have opened up, I mean, the, the, the old question, of like, do you, do you bring up the ghosts or do you bury them? Which is better? I don't know. Um, we chose to bring it up. And I think since, since we've screened the film in Bisbee, I think we can safely report that the, t the town feels like they can't not talk about it anymore. So that's good. Thanks for those questions. How much of uh, the movie was uh, based on documented uh, uh, research. Is there any written record of, of those events in 1917? You mentioned a book that you read. But is there any uh, historical archives or anything with yeah. the uh, actual names and, and people and so forth? That That's my first question. And secondly, uh, 
the movie didn't portray a great deal of diversity. There was reference to uh, Bisbee back then having, I think, people from 54 different countries. It seems that that has uh, changed significantly. It certainly has. I mean, the truth is, is Bisbee's a very divided town in some ways, so there's a large Mexican-American population, but they live completely outside of the, t the place where all the hippie artists live, basically, you know? Um, and we, I, I mean, I, I think when we have the large-scale reenactment, certainly that's a diverse, that's a diverse group of people coming together. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's being led by white people, you know, um, trying to reconcile this thing. And to me, the interesting thing is this is a white people story in some ways, because just as many Eastern Europeans were deported as Mexicans, and I think we tend to, we tend to simplify these things, you know, in some ways. And I actually wanted to look at the, the people who were doing the deporting as much as the, the, deport, the, the deported, you know. Um, so it's actually, a, a, in some ways, a film about a town. I mean, Bisbee was called a white man's camp. Um, that mentality persists today. Uh, in, in its own weird form, and I think it's really hard. Imagine if you lived in a town with 5,000 people where you cared about it so much and you love the town, and then you find out, and you're a, a white artist who came there and you wanted to be a part of something, and then you look around and there's no you know, Mexicans living anywhere near you, and then you find out the place that you live was called a white man's camp. I, I mean, it's disorienting and upsetting, and that's sort of what animates a lot of the thinking in, in the film, a lot of what people are trying to process is that feeling of like guilt, that just by association and by f sometimes family relations, right? So I wanted to tell that side of the, the story as much as anything, because I don't think we investigate that as much, you know? I want to hear Dick Graham explain his point of view. That's important. It's important to hear him work through this so that we understand what the company, when, when he says it, it what, it's one of my favorite phrases in the movie. It's like, that's from a management perspective. It's just such a simple phrase and it's very clear. And, he, and then he says like, this is why I was against the you know, protests in Vietnam. This is, this is not a story about 1917. It's a story about 20th century America in some ways. Um, to your first question, yeah, we, we had an historical advisor named Catherine Benton Cohen who is based in Georgetown and she's from Cochise County and she's pretty much the leading scholar on the deportation. And so the, the scenes that we scripted were based off of her research, um, very much so. She's written a couple books. There's, there's a few books. There's a book called Forging the Copper Collar um, and then Katie's got a couple uh, books that you can find. And the research that you see a little bit of the research, um, one of our historians in the film, Mike Anderson, is doing, he's basically figuring out what happened to the deportees and that's never been documented properly. So Katie could give us things like the full list of names, um, could give us uh, Harry Wheeler's testimonies and, and uh, a bunch of other, you know, first, first uh, like basically original documents um, and we, we scripted that. So like the IWW meeting scene is totally based off of a scene that really happened. We have no, you know, we don't have a script of what happened, but we, we based it off of something that actually happened when it happened. And the walkout is based on real things too. So yeah, there's a lot of, um, a lot of research done and you can find some good, good writing on it. Bisbee 17 is a novelization, but it's a good place to start. Uh, just a thought. Uh in the beginning of the movie, it was really hard to uh, read the script because of the shading and the size of the, the script on the you know, intro in. Um, just wondering, on the uh, ethnic makeup of you know, the deportees, was it, were there more Mexicans than shown in the film? Yeah, it was, it was half, basically, the, it was half Eastern European, half Mexican. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, I mean, it was a lot of, a lot of variation when, within that, but Eastern Europeans and Mexicans were the most um, deported that day. What was the law of necess necessity? I mean, it's not a thing. Right. <laughs> I hope that's very clear right. in the movie, that the law of necessity is a thing made up to justify a criminal act. I mean, that's, uh, it's, but, but it is, the, the, it was used afterwards and almost always, you know, uh, stopped before it got to the point that it happened in Bisbee. But it, this is this was 
the official decree of uh, Harry Wheeler that this was the law of necessity. We needed to do this, so because you needed to do this, it was somehow legal, which is f frightening and also, hopefully, um, I think the law of necessity is happening right now in this country. I mean, I think like this is a mentality being thought through, you know, you don't have to separate families from their children, you know, children from their families. That's not something you have to do, but we've done it because we're trying to prove a point. It's the, it's the, we need to, because we're being invaded by, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that mentality is a very American mentality. Um, and I, and so it's, it's a frightening phrase and it, it should be scary. I was thinking it's, we can never take our rights for granted. Um, World War II, um, my, uh, Grandparents and parents were uh, rounded up on presidential executive order in California and uh, you know, put in concentration camps. Uh, my parents actually met at the assembly center you know, uh, at the racetrack. And then uh, my father was drafted and he was uh, fighting in Italy while his uh, you know, parents were behind uh, barbed wire and machine guns in Utah. Um, yeah. Um, was wondering about the deportees. Uh, any idea what happened to them? Did any, any of them return to town? Did they die in the middle of the desert? So first of all, thank you for sharing that. The, the, we were thinking about Japanese internment camps, certainly, um, while making the film. That's one of the, the, the powerful thing about a cattle car is, is what it connotes for all kinds of other things. Um, and to me, just remembering, we know about that story and we yet we've still not really dealt with it uh, we don't know about this story and how are they connected and what do they say about the makeup of the country and 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 like you said how easily rights can be taken away right um the the deportees what i was just saying before this historian mike anderson who's in the film he's done the best research that anyone's ever done on what's happened to them so it, it's actually really fascinating. Families were, poor, were pulled apart and some never came back together. Some people never came back to Bisbee. Some people came back to Bisbee 10 years later. Some people came back 12 years later. There were guns and the, basically the, the, the town was blocked and every entry pointed to town for many years afterwards and you had to prove that you weren't one of the IWW that got deported to get back in. Uh, but people snuck into town, um, and sometimes, like, there were stories that we heard, like, someone was sick and they got to come back or something. Um, most of the people, of course, were drafted and went to the war, which is the great irony, right? They were deported because they were supposedly, you know, um, bomb-throwing radicals. Well, they weren't. They were workers who were trying to get better wages and working conditions, and then the moment that they didn't have protection in the copper mines, they were drafted and they went to war. And most of that's what happened to many people. But there were other incredible stories, like one deportee shows up in 1945 on the cover of the Los Angeles Times having become a police officer and he saved a child in a very dramatic way in, the, in downtown LA and was a hero. And just imagine if everyone knew that he was being deported because he was an anti-American activist, right? Um, and even more amazing, someone who was deported ended up being in, in the Japanese internment camps as well. Um, so imagine that life, 30 years later, they were in the center of some another atrocity. So uh, it, it's a crazy thing. For us in the film, it's important that you have that question, what happened to the deportees? Because by the end of the film, it's about what's, the, the film's happening in the present, right? So it's like, it's really about what the town's doing now, but it's my favorite question to get because I hope we're all thinking about what happened to them. Hi. Um, first of all, congratulations on the film. I think it was great. Thank you. Um, so as I was watching the film, I couldn't help but think of the Holocaust, you know, with the cattle car and having regular citizens just report people and, and things like that. But I think there's a more relevant connection to this film. And I think it's the issue about sanctuary cities. And um, there's this debate about whether um, you know, that responsibility of ICE should be delegated to local police um, forces. And then so if you look at the story of Bisbee, it's a local thing, whereas what happened in Germany was a national thing. And so I think Bisbee is very relevant to what's going on right now. Um, and so I, I totally think my agree. question to you is, do you think that your film, you know, bringing this story to light, 
do you think that contributes in some way um, to help people understand what the sanctuary city debate is about? I mean, we hope so. I mean, certainly, that's that's a hope, and thank you for that. That's a great point. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the local aspect of it is super important. All politics is local, right? Well, atrocities happen at a local level, and and um, and yeah, th this is what we're experiencing right now in this country is is this massive divide between what the federal government's doing and what local governments are doing, and and on all kinds of levels. And that's, that is the next, I mean, we're, you know, that's the next war really. And I don't mean to use that term lightly. It really is, it's happening. It's been happening for a while, state and local governments versus federal government in all kinds of ways. In, in this case, it's, it's, it's about protecting people's lives in, in a very specific way. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what's very important to understand is that we interviewed the chief of police, I remember, and, and he, he was like, the sheriff of Cochise County came into Bisbee to execute this plan for the for the mining companies. Well, there was a Bisbee Police Department. What were they doing, right? It's a and I don't know. We no one knows. They 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 were absent from the story. Um, they disappeared. What does that mean, right? And and so that's just another way into what you're saying. So I mean, we we hope. We've made a film that where we started thinking about labor more, and then some asshole gets elected president, we start thinking about something very different, right? And and um, if you know any stories about the border, I've been going to Bisbee for many years, this is not, this is not, uh, a, 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 this, the things that are happening now on the border are not overnight problems. These are problems that have been building and building and building for many years. Tombstone, there's one line in Tombstone where it's like, we're a Second Amendment city and whatever. Tombstone is the home of the Minutemen who, you know, in the early 2000s were killing people on the border and, and gotten, they were considered heroes by some and murderers by others, you know? So um, this stuff is building and building and building. And, and we've, we have a horrible situation that the film is incredibly much more relevant than we ever intended it to be even, you know, and that's where we are with it. Day. And to me, it's very relevant to the city of Stanford. It's just very, very relevant. It's always easy to look afar and look at that with a critical eye, but it's just, where is our humanity? Stanford has a story also. People might have been deported in different ways, but it has a deportation story as well. And so as, the, as we look at Brisbane, we also need to look at Stanford. And I want to say thank you so very much, but I think the target is, is that all people, we need to remember we are human beings. We are all the same. The people who are coming here come with the same hope that the original people came with. And so how will we ever put it together? Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Very I mean, much. what's so amazing to think about Bisbee is like, it was a diverse um, city that because of the, the mines gave opportunity for diverse people to move into the city, right? Like opportunity led to diversity and then that diversity was taken away. I mean, it, and, it's, and that is a story of America. It's a story that's happened in so many places. Thank you so much. So listen, that, uh, we're gonna wrap it up, but um, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you question. so much. And thank you guys. And, and we wanna thank Adam Fernbaum and you, Adam. Avon. This is a, this is like if a film team had a home court, this is our home court, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming, thank you so much.